So uh, we're going to visit now about some things we've been learning from disaggregated high resolution electric use data and you know what are potential insights from it and implications of those. But this is not intended to say that these are definitive uh, findings, but rather suggestions from the data, which we then turn over to the academic research community. So a little bit about our research trials. Uh, we're over 1,200 homes in three states right now, Texas, Colorado, and here in San Diego. And then, uh, we, so we install and operate data uh, acquisition equipment in homes and businesses, primarily in homes, but in about 100 businesses in Austin, Texas, and Boulder, Colorado as well, and then four public schools. So uh, through this process, we uh, tested over uh, 25 energy use measurement products and uh, have arrived at a favored approach, but we don't only take one approach. But our primary method for uh, data collection and extraction is CT collar systems or current transformer collars. So we'll uh, typically do 12 to 24 CT collars uh, per home, I and mean, we measure typically at uh, one minute intervals, uh, but in some homes we measure at one second intervals. And so we also operate uh, smart meters, electric gas and water, and then uh, gateway devices. So on the field trials management, uh, so these are, we operate them in participants' homes. And then uh, we, that requires us to operate ongoing customer service uh, for those customers because we are uh, providing that data back to the customers, but there's uh, a fair amount of customers, ongoing customer service that one needs to do as part of active field trials management. So that through that, we created a web, <clears throat> a web portal and a mobile app in both English and Spanish. Uh, in part, that's driven by that uh, we're through support from the Verizon Foundation. We're doing apartment uh, research, appliance level apartment uh, electric use in five apartment complexes, uh, one through support of San Diego Gas and Electric uh, here in San Diego. And then uh, two in Austin are over 40 year old apartment buildings, which Spanish is the first language spoken in all but one of the apartments. That's what necessitated having a Spanish language version of our, of our uh, web portal and mobile app. And then also we have a seniors only complex is a third one and then a fourth in Austin is a lot like Savita in San Diego. It's uh, a little bit of a skew toward younger and it's a new green built apartment complex. So it appears uh, from everything we can tell, we don't operate the world's largest, largest database, but we operate the world's largest research database. In other words, all of our data we make available for free to the academic research community and this is, uh, so in fact, I think several of you are uh, actually doing research on this database. And then uh, all of our data is anonymized and, uh, and protected through processes that are approved by Pacific Northwest National Lab. And uh, so we are, it appears that we are managing about the third most electric use data in the state of Texas each day at a one hour AMI uh, comparable of about two million customers a day. That's about the amount of data we're managing each day. And we're carrying out four, po yes, uh-huh. Uh, or, well, you can dynamically search it online, or you can download sets. Uh, and in some cases, uh, some of the folks in the room have actually downloaded the entire set. It's a pretty big set, uh, but that... Even, like, yes, even appliance level, yes. Uh -huh. And in fact, in, uh, for about 150 uh, homes in Austin and about 40 homes in San Diego, we have home energy audits. Uh, so there's uh, actually uh, uh, static data on things like dem demographics, how old the appliances make and brand and things like that. So if you go to PecanStreet.org, uh, that there's information there on, uh, it's called DataPort, and uh, some of the uh, members of our uh, research advisory board, uh, including the chair of it, Zico Coulter, uh, who's you know, one of the faculty for this conference, uh, are, uh, are actually, have been beta testing the data visualization tool and providing us uh, guidance on the structure of the, of the portal. Yeah. So if you go uh, to pecanstreet.org, uh, and in fact, if you uh, if you uh, email info at pecanstreet.org, say it would be like uh, access um, an academic researcher. I'd like uh, access to the data, then we can set up that whole process. It could typically be approved uh, for one level of access almost immediately another within a day or two. 
So uh, our four publicly disclosed behavioral interventions <clears throat> are pricing trial, thermostat cycling, uh, preset defaults on thermostats, and text message appeals. So the Pecan Street data port is the mechanism by which the academic research community can access uh, all of the data at no cost. And uh, right now there's over 50 universities in 12 nations that are uh, accessing the site to carry out original uh, scientific and public interest uh, academic research. And so then through this you can actually access uh, whole home data and do online dynamic visualizations. You say, okay, I want to look at a year. Okay, I want to look at 50 homes. I want to look at 10 homes. I want to adjust the parameters of the time. But you can also go to individual appliances, as in this case with uh, air conditioning. And this, this one, this, these uh, dynamic visualizations here are actually for combined compressor and furnace, but you can actually separate those out to compressor or furnace if you prefer. So first uh, insight, uh, or first observation and potential implications. And uh, you know, this is, there's gonna be kind of an ongoing theme here, which is data quality is a huge challenge on any type of uh, customer utility use data that is uh, downloaded either wirelessly or even over wired uh, connections. And, and what this is, is that this is why there's buffering on websites. I think probably all of you understand this already, but uh, if you uh, have any sort of internet connection or cellular connection to extract data, uh, there's going to be gaps in that uh, connection. And then, uh, so the data management systems that acquire data wirelessly uh, are going to experience gaps. There's no getting around it. So the question is, well, how do you adjust for it? You know, what are the, uh, the data quality processes to ensure that in a world where there's inevitable data gaps when you're extracting data uh, from uh, over either cellular or proprietary mesh networks or, uh, or, uh, or wireless. So one is that if uh, your solution uh, re relies on data for a specific timestamp period, uh, then the data uh, equipment needs on-site data caching. So processor, onboard, onboard processor, and that could be in some cases we just do a Raspberry Pi. Uh, in other cases we use the system that we use uh, is from a company out of Boulder, Colorado, eGage, and they have uh, onboard processing and data storage so that, it, uh, for example, if we pull from the device but we have one of those inevitable data gaps, then we're able to go back and repull uh, later on once the gap is detected. So an example of a scenario where that would be an issue is time of use pricing. So let's say that you're just reading meter data every 30 days for billing and you have a data gap. It's not that big of a deal because you can actually go back and re-pull from the meter and you, know, you might have added another day or uh, so on there, but fundamentally you're not uh, presented with uh, something that would result in an, in an, in, an inaccuracy for the customer uh, of a financial nature. However, if you're doing time of use pricing, let's say uh, you have critical peak pricing from 4 to 6 p.m., and uh, your system is measuring, wire, uh, measuring every hour, but it has gaps at uh, 1 and 2 p.m. reads, and then at 3 p.m. it's pulling three hours of data suddenly, uh, what do you charge the customer for that? And uh, if there's no onboard data caching, then it's going to only provide you the last three hours, and so that would result in some sort of a need to adjust your pricing structures. Uh, but as, as a, uh, another out implication of the fact or the observe observation that there's just inevitable data gaps from any data extraction method uh, out there is, uh, I mean, other than data loggers probably in some of them. But in other words, if you're pulling it over any kind of network, then uh, you need to have in your database structure automated uh, gap detection. Uh, so that if you, uh, another actually weird uh, fa facet of, uh, of CT caller systems that they'll have a spike of like, you know, one 15 minute interval or for example, a one minute interval, it might be showing an average kilowatt draw for a refrigerator of, you know, 15 to 135 watts and suddenly it'll show 220,000 watts for a, you know, one minute interval. That's clearly uh, uh, an anomalous value but uh, if you don't correct for it, it can actually, <clears throat> it can, uh, depending on the time interval you're looking at, it can actually cause some real screw-ups in the data, using the technical term. 
So uh, next observation we've seen is, and this is for uh, the research participants in Texas, is that uh, during peak demand hours, over 80% of discretionary electric use was for air conditioning. And the average amount of non-HVAC discretionary use in any moment was about 397 watts. So uh, first off, what is discretionary electric use? It's electric use that a customer can uh, decide to turn on or off uh, without significant inconvenience. So you can turn off a refrigerator, but uh, that would have very meaningful uh, inconvenience factor for the customer, which is, you know, maybe even the food spoils. Uh, or you can turn off their Wi-Fi router, but then if you're relying on the Internet to communicate with them, uh, you might have problem reconnecting. So, in other words, this is the stuff that uh, the people are consciously turning on and off as opposed to the stuff like clocks on microwave ovens and a refrigerator for which the inconvenience factor is such that uh, it, would be, uh, it would be a real imposition on the customer. So, this, uh, looking at this, uh, this is uh, homes in blue are participating in a critical peak pricing trial with 62 cent a kilowatt hour uh, critical peak pricing and the other customers are not uh, participating. And so, you know, what you see is, uh, it seems like the, the, what, the big variable here is do people work at their homes during the day or are they, are they working not in the home during the day? And that has a big implication on the other stuff that they're using in the home. But otherwise, it, does, it doesn't appear that there's a very significant difference in how much of home electric use is allocated uh, to air conditioning or comfort in a, in a sun belt area. So first off, what does that mean? Well, one of the implications, it reflects how important comfort is to people. Another is that uh, for electric utilities in warm regions, uh, it's going to be challenging to implement demand management programs that focus on loads other than air conditioning. Now, if you're in coastal California, this is clearly a different situation where air conditioning is significantly less of a factor uh, particularly residential air conditioning. But uh, if you are inland California all the way over to Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, uh, this is going to, uh, and you're trying to do a peak demand management, uh, it is uh, an implication from this is it's difficult to find a cost effective path other than air conditioning for peak demand management. So the, the third one is the only common residential load we're seeing that demonstrates seasonal variability is HVAC. And, uh, you know, when you think about this intuitively, it makes sense. There's no September way to use a microwave oven versus a March way to use a microwave oven or, you know, an April way to watch TV versus a November way to watch TV. And so uh, what are the implications of that? Well, uh, by the way, this is fascinating. So this is from ERCOT, the Texas ISO from much of Texas. And what it shows is peak on a March afternoon and peak on an August afternoon relative uh, on the y-axis, it's total uh, megawatts, uh, uh, instantaneous megawatts at that time, and then how much of that is allocated uh, to which customer class. So what you see then is C large CNI is relatively flat uh, between spring peak and summer peak. In a commercial, uh, seeing the difference, uh, small commercial does have a big jump, but it's residential that's really explaining the jump. And, and so what you just saw, right, 80% of discretionary peak electric use is HVAC, and 70-plus percent of overall system upsizing, at least in uh, ERCOT, is driven uh, by residential, and what you see is we, uh, at least in the Sun Belt, uh, area Sun Belt that have air conditioning, have air conditioning use, the system is sized for residential air conditioning, largely. So that, uh, that kind of uh, leads into a pretty significant implication being that the pathway for peak demand management is going uh, not as much through CNI. CNI is actually good, uh, really good, because you get if you can do it, you can get big results per customer, but a lot of that's already happening. And so if you're trying to look at what is the pathway, it's difficult to find a pathway that avoids residential air conditioning. And um, 
And then also, because the behaviors associated with non-HVAC electric use are baked in all year long, it's, uh, it's also going to be a real challenge to try to implement any kind of behavior modification for things other than air conditioning that, because those behaviors are pretty baked in all year long. Uh, so this is an interesting one. Uh, EV charging is more distributed in the real world than has been assumed to behavioral models. So we have the nation's highest residential concentration of electric cars in our research trial, uh, 60 in a, in, in a one-third of a square mile neighborhood, and uh, 75 approximately overall, measuring one-minute interval charging at level two uh, in all of these homes. So what do they do? So the orange line represents what was assumed in research models such as IEEE's, which made the assumption that, and a lot of models have made this assumption, that everybody would come home at 5 p.m., charge for three hours. You know, of course, we don't live in the 1950s anymore. So that intuitively, we all have, once we saw the day, we're like, yeah, that made sense. Our lives are much more fluid. Uh, you know, we don't, you know, with certain exceptions, like say a military base perhaps or something like that, uh, most people, you know, they may have kids' soccer practice after work or they go out, after, out, out to dinner after work or they meet a contractor at home during the day or they work from the home during the day. And as a result, so the, both the pricing and non-pricing trial lines were quite a bit more distributed than had been assumed in the models. Uh, actually, we found that out last, about a year ago, a couple of months ago, Opower came out with a similar finding. Theirs focused largely in California and ours focused largely in Texas, but we, we came to the same observation. And they've got a lot of great data scientists. Uh, so uh, one of the implications is if this holds up, and now we see two studies that have made the same observation, is that uh, EVs are, have a load that's going to look more like an electric clothes dryer. You know, when it's on, it's pretty big but it's on in a, in a, within bounds at a more randomized time, right? So electric clothes dryers can pull five to six kW when they're on. But, you know, when they're on is largely, you know, from 5 p.m. through midnight and on weekends, right? I mean, it's not all coming on in mass at 4 p.m. and it gets to be 85 or 95 degrees, which is the case with air conditioning, right? So air conditioning has a non-behavioral trigger tied to how hot it is outside for a large chunk of the air conditioning load. So it has a non-behavioral trigger, whereas EV charging has a behavioral trigger, and we know that everything else in our lives, when there's a behavioral trigger, as opposed to an ambient temperature trigger, that has a much more randomized profile, and that seems to be what we're seeing with EVs. Uh, so this is uh, the gas version of household appliances are much less energy intensive than the electric version. So what you see, just for looking at a representative load, uh, combined gas and electric costs, it's, uh, you know, and you all know this, uh, using electricity for thermal applications is a really inefficient use of electricity. You know, if you want to create heat, it's better just to light a flame at the point where you want to generate the heat than it is to go through the whole process of generating steam through burning coal or, you know, gas, you know, 100 miles away converting it to electricity, reconverting it into heat back inside the premises. But what that suggests is that uh, uh, from an energy uh, conservation perspective and a, and a green building perspective, the gas appliances maybe should be in the conversation uh, for green building codes uh, since there is, a, there is a pretty dramatic in, uh, gain in energy efficiency. You know, so for example, electric space heating may be the most wasteful use of electricity, that or electric water heating out there. And uh, if there's a way to convert, particularly electric space heating, uh, where there are, it really is not much of an option other than the gas heat, there is solar water heating on the, uh, <clears throat> on the water heating side. But, that, but there are some real uh, public interest, environmental and consumer advantages uh, to using gas to generate heat for those four appliances typically that are found in the home where there's an option. Uh, here's this one. West-facing solar can generate more electricity during summer peak hours than typical south-facing systems. Now, this is important. Solar has the most localized impact of any of the new disruptive types of products showing up, right? I mean, if you live in Alaska versus live in South Texas, you're going to have longer summer days in Alaska and shorter to non-existent uh, sunlight hours in the winter. So it's... Uh, 
And then also, if like when we're doing work in San Diego, Austin, and Boulder, well, in San Diego and Austin, in this case San Diego, mountains to the east, uh, uh, more sunshine in the afternoon. Austin, uh, slight skew, slightly cloudier mornings, more sunshine in the afternoon. Boulder, mountains to the west, uh, and they're the Rockies. So they're big ones, right? And so uh, one would anticipate the west-facing solar uh, in, in uh, Boulder would be plagued by, you know, the afternoon shadow created by the Rockies. Whereas that's not, that would, it would be more of a potential, if any, after, is shadowing in San Diego would be in the morning hours. But this is a pretty pronounced deal. So first off, we looked at, this is just one graph here. The red line is west-facing system, south-facing or gray, and then the blue, or there's about 20 homes in our research out of 200 with solar that have both south and west-facing systems. So, you know, it's pretty noisy when you look at it for all day generation, how much electricity was generated over the course of a day. But then when you look at the 3 to 7 p.m. peak demand hours, uh, it becomes very banded. And in fact, the west-facing systems on a normalized basis last summer are generating 64% uh, more electricity between 3 and 7 p.m. than were south-facing systems. And actually, interestingly, we now looked at a year of data on this, and for the 3 to 7 p.m. period, the uh, west-facing systems generated more electricity during those hours just about all 365 days than did the south-facing systems. Now, of course, in fact, by August, and as, this, as you see in this graph, by August, the south-facing systems are producing more. There are only two months we've observed to date where west-facing systems, during the course of an entire day, outproduced south-facing systems on homes in Austin, Texas with peaked roofs, uh, pitched roofs, and that's uh, May and June. Uh, actually, in July it happened, but it's not as clear if what, what imp impact weather had on that. But what it suggests is, that, and, and you're starting to see this in Europe as well, is uh, for a variety of reasons, it, it may be that, that from a utility perspective or in a critical peak pricing regime that a west-facing systems may have advantages or benefits that uh, are in addition to those from south-facing systems. So the utility offers incentives for solar. They may want to extend uh, those uh, rebates to west-facing systems. And the customers of time of use pricing, depending on where they live, uh, and this is one of the things we'd be real interested in, in, in researchers in this room looking at is, well, under various scenarios, what would be the relative uh, advantages under a time of use pricing structure of west versus south? and then extrapolate that for different regions. Uh, so where they're present, electric, seven where they're present, electric vehicles are the largest or second largest source of electricity in use in virtually every home. So uh, about 200 kilowatt hours a month. Uh, in the areas of air conditioning, 18 to 35 percent. O power found in California, uh, coastal California, about 60 percent uh, for electric cars. But in, a, in an environment where utilities are becoming cost stressed, or revenue stress as, as solar adoption increases, California being the most prominent example. The, uh, you know, the arrival of the electric vehicle, uh, first observation is it's looking to be a lot easier to serve than had been feared. And the second is, is it's uh, a lot of new revenue uh, to cover utility system operations. And so that's, um, so uh, as a general matter, EV customers are gonna be more profitable than non-EV customers for utilities. So number eight, so uh, we've worked with gate, we've tested a lot of gateway devices out. And uh, actually, there's not a lot on the market. We've tested those that are out in the market, and they're all terrible. Uh, so uh, and that's because none of them, uh, they have high level of data loss. And, they were, and the way that uh, cloud, uh, cloud uh, computing is priced is on a per transaction basis. So if you're trying to do higher resolution data, which you really need to do higher resolution data if you're going to do disaggregation, for example, you know, I know that from some work done out of Stanford and found that you need to really get to 10 second intervals uh, to be able to disaggregate meaningfully uh, whole home electric use. So the idea has been in some places we'll have a gateway device that's in charge of pinging that meter more often because there's no system reliability or billing purpose for the utility to be sending that data over their network every seven to 10 seconds. The problem is, is that the, that the gateway devices, because none of them have data caching, uh, they have very significant gaps to the point where the data is practically useless. So this is going to impact the ability of third-party services that want to use 
higher resolution data from such as green button type applications. Uh, nine, I think we saw this in the previous presentation, customers typically lose interest in uh, monitoring their electric use after a short period, a month or so. You'll see a high uptake uh, when you get the mobile app or the web portal made available and then it drops off the face of the earth after a short period. People just want it to work. So what is, uh, so what does that mean? If, so if, if there are solutions that are premised on making the customer a more engaged consumer of electricity, there's some real headwinds in doing that because uh, now th there's a difference between conscious versus automated, right? So demand response is an example of something where the default is it's automated. Now, whether customers like it or not is a different question, but it is at least not uh, prey to the blinking VCR clock syndrome in which large chunks of people will not interact with the most basic types of technology on a predictable and sustaining basis. So uh, it's the whole kind of, you know, Thaler and Sunstein's work that if you have a default that the customer can override, well, most customers won't override it and fewer will as time goes by. Uh, this is interesting. So what EV drivers tell others about their electric cars differs significantly from what policymakers and utilities and many automakers say are the benefits of EVs. So at the time that we, uh, we about a year in to our research, we asked, uh, we got 69 out of 70, 68 out of 69 responses because we hounded people <laughs> to respond to the survey. But we asked them, why'd you get your electric car? Unsurprisingly, number one was environmental benefit. Number two was save money on gasoline. And then the other three showed up, uh, three others, new technologies, performance, and quietness were a little further down. After a year, what do you tell others about electric car? What do you like the best about your electric car? They're fast. <laughs> There's really one electric car company that has positioned their car as a high-performance vehicle as Tesla. BMW is doing a little bit about, uh, about that. And uh, then quiet's number two. And so... And the environmental benefit actually came in at zero. Well, there's no feedback, really, other than some kind of growth, you know, aggregate, like, you know, customers' electric cars and uh, saved eight tons of carbon this month. What does that mean to somebody, right? I mean, it's, it's so uh, remote for people. So what are the implications? There's a lot to read, but you all have a copy of the presentation. Is that, uh, look, don't not tout the, the uh, environmental benefits. Uh, that was clearly the most important reason why people got their electric car out of the gates. It is worth touting that. It is also worth promoting the fact that they're fast and quiet because there's a lot of people that buy cars based on the fact that they're fast and or quiet. See Lexus. Uh, another implication of this, though, is uh, that car companies should be very wary of downgrading the speed or quietness of their EVs. So you have some car companies who are actually... Uh, throttling back the max speed uh, or the acceleration potential of their electric cars and others that are adding noise in, thereby hobbling the two most popular features of electric cars for those who own them. <laughs> and by the way, what, what people say they like about a product drives what most of the market uh, listens to. They don't listen to advertising. Diffusion of innovation theory, for those familiar with it, the reported experiences that people have already adopted is the number one driving factor why the rest of the market chooses to adopt an innovation rod. So the lowest hanging fruit for utility demand management is people who work away from the home, meaning not at home during the day. This is an example of one home uh, where they're not at home clearly during the day. So what you see is asking them to do demand response is a very modest and non-existent in position so you go, well, how would you go about that? Well, you would uh, target major employers because you know that at least one of the members of the households at work during the day because they're working there. Honorable mention, pool pumps, which are the big bad brother of the electric car. I'll stop there. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions or follow-up. Yes. So uh, you talked about um, television use maybe not being something that, that would change depending on season and so on. Right. I mean, you know, within modest bounds probably. Yeah. I mean, what about kids being home over summer vacation yeah. and that sort of thing? Sure. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's going to be, you know, specific 
uh, to families where one of the things is that if the parent is able to be home during the day in the summer of the kids, that suggests the parent is able to be home with, uh, during the rest of the year, uh, other than teachers. There will, of course, be uh, specific demographic subsets where there may be a seasonal element to some of those things. Uh, but it's a general purpose, uh, matter. Most people's work patterns don't change during the year meaningfully, and that means that their behavior patterns but that, obviously, that there's no blanket statements in customer behavior. We also talked yeah. about, uh, at least on one slide, you have water as well as energy. Yes. Is there a difference in the way that you would monitor water use versus energy use, and a difference in the way people respond? Yeah. Uh, we don't know on how they'll respond yet, although, because uh, we've just started that, uh, but our hypothesis is they'll behave differently. Uh, because, for instance, people are intuitively or personally more familiar with what a gallon means versus a kilowatt hour, and particularly in areas with drought, there just there has uh, been observed different behavioral responses in terms of drought, things like hoarding behaviors and things like that. If you're going to use whole home. Well, because we're directly measuring circuits. We're not relying on the whole home. We're actually reading the refrigerator circuit and actually reading the AC compressor circuit. Right, but doesn't that provide kind of good ground truth for doing kind of disaggregation? It absolutely does, yeah. one-second data? Yes, yeah. Are you guys planning to collect that at some point? Well, we're doing one-second data, but this, the question is, okay, how do you crack the nut of, a, of a disaggregation and uh, there's two ways to do it. One is read whole home data, but read it so frequently that you can extract individual appliances because you're reading it frequently. The other is to simply measure it uh, directly. Those are the two pathways to appliance level data re reading. And so we're, we're, we have the data that makes possible refinements of algorithms, and, uh, but, but that's because we have ground truth data from a direct measurement of that circuit. Yeah. You know, it's a good, like, test data set. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have, and we do have some of that data. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, on some of the participants, uh, those, the text message or app notification subset, they're actually getting the app is being used as a tool for interventions. Uh, text message appeals on critical peak pricing events or critical peak events are, are, are appearing to be kind of a real promising area because you don't have to ping in that often. You know, there's you know 10 to 15 critical uh, peak events in, in most areas that employ that. So if you're only intervening, off, we're seeing it. We saw a seven percent reduction uh, in peak electric use through that. And so that's and it's so simple and cost effective to do that. That that's a real promising area uh, for uh, interventions. But then again, you know, demand response doesn't require behavioral response. So there's that too. So it's I mean it's. A demand response deal is if you sign up, if you can get them to sign up and get them to do the first thing, then the behavior will be automated from that point on because it's driven centrally as opposed to uh, manual decisions. I don't have as much insight because uh, that's an ongoing trial, and I think it ends this month, like tomorrow. You know, so we'll have more insight on that at the conclusion of that, and then the San Diego interventions will go through November. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you know that's an interesting observation. It, the challenge is right is that if you're running an electric clothes dryer, uh, it's requiring six thousand watts. You know, and uh, if you're running a gas clothes dryer, it's requiring about two hundred watts. Uh, that's a pretty big delta, and so that that is in a transition uh, to a, a world where it's all renewables, uh, you would look and say, well, what can we hold off on uh, while we get our renewable systems up and running to a, a, a more robust level? On the other hand, if you're trying to soak up a lot of extra distributed generation, you might want something like an electric clothes dryer and time it to run at noon, right? So, yeah, I think one of the, the things we keep returning to is that uh, there are regional implications. So the, the, we're based in Austin, Texas. The utility that serves the eastern edge of Austin all the way to uh, the suburbs of Houston is a co-op, Blue Bond and Electric Co-op. Their peak demand season is winter. And that's because almost every one of their customers has electric space heating. So there you go.